Thank you, Matti, for the kind words. Uh, I'm also very happy being uh, at Aalto. And as, as, as Matti suggested, I'm going to be talking about invention. Uh, I'm happy and lucky also that I'm last because we had two very imaginative, inventive people giving their talks before me. And I'm actually talking about the process through which we as a society find uh, the Günthers and the Tommies of the future. Uh, and in terms of motivation, I'm not going to go back 2,000 years as Günther did. I'm going to go back only 110 years, roughly, for Finland. Uh, and what I'm showing here is the GDP per capita for Finland, uh, such that I've scaled it to be one in 1900, roughly the time my grandparents were born. And what this graph tells you is that in those 110 years, uh, we've 14-fold increased our living standards. It hasn't come for free. There are all kinds of bad things Günther was pointing out to excessive use of materials and so on. But I, I want to remind you that there are good things involved. In 1900s, uh, in early 1900s, uh, infant mortality was 15 out of 100. Now it's one or two per 1,000. Uh, there was no sanitation, no running water, all kinds of things that we take for granted didn't exist. So the world has become a better place for a large part of the uh, human population. And the question I'm interested in, many economists are interested in, you could argue all economists are interested in, is how did this happen? How did this come about? Well, we're still looking at that, so you don't need to kick us out of ALT or any other economics department in any near future. But we know one thing for sure. It didn't happen because we work harder. So this green graph here tells you the number of hours worked per head. Again, normalizing it so that uh, it takes value one in 1900. And if anything, we work slightly less than the parents of my grandparents, yet our living standards are 14-fold. Uh, and so these two graphs already give you an idea of the partial answer we, we by now know uh, uh, is, is the answer to this riddle, and it is that we use our time way more effectively than our grandparents did. We do better things with our time, we do the same things with less time than was done before. Uh, and given that that's the source of increased well-being, that's the source of using less materials, hopefully, in the future, that's the source of having preventive uh, ways of, for preventing diseases rather than just curing them, we want to know where do these inventions come from? Uh, now, as the two previous uh, talks exemplify, inventing is a human activity. So, Although I talk about inventions, I'm going to actually be talking about inventors. Where do the people who come up with ideas and new inventions come from? But I'm going to also going to briefly touch on, uh, upon another question, which is, once these inventions take place, how are the pre proceeds divided? The last 10, 15, 20 years in particular have witnessed that many people feel they've been left out of the progress, for better or worse, for good or bad reasons. Uh, and so we want to understand what happens when somebody comes up uh, with a uh, way of improving our world, who gets the proceeds? And so let me start from the second question. I'm going to ask it in a narrow way. So I'm going to focus on uh, a firm that uh, comes up with an invention, and I'm going to ask who within that firm benefits. So I'm leaving out the big benefits that actually most of us get as consumers of the new drugs, the new architecture, and so on, and I'm just going to look within the firm. And clearly, there are a few potential uh, targets. First, the inventors can get the benefits. Or maybe the entrepreneur and the owners get the benefits. But it could also be that the workers in the firm, be they white-collar workers in the offices or blue-collar workers on the factory floor, may also benefit. Uh, I'm going to show this with just one graph uh, from a paper that's forthcoming in uh, American Economic Review Papers and Proceedings. This is joint work with Ufuk Akchidit from University of Chicago, Philippe Aguillon at Collège de France, and Ari Hutinen from Uvascula. What do we see? We see that the increased size of the wage pie is split so that the entrepreneurs indeed take a big chunk. But notice that the workers, which is the greenish part and the orange part take actually a bigger slice counted together. And this part here, which is one quarter of the increased pie, goes to the blue collar workers on the factory floor. And the Tonys and Günthers, I have bad news for you. You only get less than 10% of the increase in the pie. Uh, as an economist, 
one wants to understand not only these magnitudes, but the effects of these magnitudes and, and the mechanisms that lead to these magnitudes. Well, let me then switch to my first question. Where do the inventors come from? Uh, as an economist, one is interested in, in how the way we organize our society affects this process. Could we somehow improve our schooling system or anything else so that we have more inventors or better inventors? The way I'm going to proceed with this is fitting for Aalto University because I'm going to be concentrating on technical innovations, fully understanding that there are many inventions that are very valuable that would never be counted on my, uh, on my variables. So coming up with better ways of managing firms is an invention. It's not going to be in my talk. Coming up with better ways of bringing up kids is an invention. It's not going to be in my talk. Okay, so to some extent I'm going to be searching under a lamppost, but one that is very important for Aalto University. And let me motivate this by showing you a graph from 1930s America. Uh, and what do I have here? So my inventors are people who get a patent, and I have the income of their parents on the x-axis. So the poorest parents are here at 1, and the richest parents here at 100. And the probability to invent is on the y-axis. What we can see is that it makes almost no difference whether you're born to poor or middle-income parents, but if your goal in life is to become an inventor, you must hope to have been born to very high-income parents, because that really makes a big difference. Now, 1930s America was a very unequal place, and we would imagine that it could indeed be true that the upbringing and the resources one needs to become a successful inventor were only accessible by the very wealthy in the 1930s America. Now, if that was the case, one would think that zooming 70 years, sorry, 40 years past to the 70s, 80s Finland, things would look very different. We had universal health care, we had free education up to and including PhD education in the sciences, uh, we had good maternal clinics, whatnot. Let me show you the picture. It's here, with the green crosses being mother's income and the blue dots father's income. Again, the poorest here, the richest here. You can see that it's pretty much the same story. If you were born in the 60s or 70s or 80s Finland and you wanted to become an inventor, you must have hoped to have won in the parental lottery and ended up somewhere here. And notice having a pretty high income parent makes almost no difference, but having a very high income parent seems to matter. Now, is it really the case that it's money that matters, or could it be something else? That's what we're looking at together with my co-authors. So, is it the financial resources? Or could it be that it's something else that the parents provide, like the educational background they have, the social environment they live in, their roles as fathers or mothers, I'm not going to be able to say that about that much today, uh, given that we only have a limited amount of time. Could it be that your own ability has something to do with it? And finally, what's the role of somebody's own education? I'm going to be trying to slice the onion I showed you through these different factors. And in terms of motivating why I'm looking at these, let me show you a few graphs. And let's first look at social background. So here I have the father. Here I have the mother, and the socioeconomic status is increasing from the left to the right. So that white-collar senior workers are here, and miscellaneous social backgrounds are here. And you can see you'd rather want to have either your father and or your mother of high social status if you want to become an inventor. What about parental education? I'm again going to be showing father's education and mother's education separately. And now I've also separated a science education they are the red bars from non-science education, the blue bars. We start from basic education, we go all the level to a master's and a PhD. And clearly, again, in terms of invention, it's very helpful to have your father have attended Aalto and obtained a PhD, or your mother, for that matter. What about your own ability? Uh, here, we're lucky. Uh, to be able to work with Finnish data. As you know, most Finnish men uh, go and do their military service. They're administered a battery of tests, including IQ tests, and we've been able to gain access to that. And so what I have here now on the y x-axis is IQ. And just to make sure you don't misread this, this is the IQ percentile. So 
I'm not saying that all Finnish men are below average IQ. Uh, okay. Rather, here are the ones that do the worst, and here are the ones that do the absolute best in terms of the uh, IQ test in the military. And you can see that being smart helps, being very smart is very helpful. As you can guess, all of these things are correlated with each other, and these graphs hopefully suggest to you that the first graph I showed you where I just had parental income is maybe not the full picture. What I'm going to be doing next is I'm going to be slicing the onion part by part. So let me, this is the first graph cleaned out to make it look nicer. And if you compare the probability of inventing uh, for people who are born to the lowest income fathers to that of the highest 5% income fathers, you see that there's like a six-fold difference. What happens when I take parental socioeconomic status into account? This is what happens. We go from the blue curve to the red curve and the difference goes down by like 40%. What happens if I, in addition, take parental education into account? We go further down to the green curve. And now I've more than halved the difference between being born to a low income or a high income father. Finally, let me also control for individual ability through IQ, and we go further down to the orange graph. And now the advantage one gets from being born into a, to a high-income father as opposed to a low-income father, it's still sizable, it's like a three-fold increase, but it's only a three-fold increase instead of a six-fold increase. So, it is absolutely true that uh, in one of the many lotteries that we participate in in life, one, the first one is one of the most important ones, how to choose your parents. Uh, what our data shows is that that's actually a multidimensional lottery with some dimensions being more important than others. So, so in terms of invention, not other important things in life, having a father with a PhD is four times as important as having a high-income father. Uh, being in the top 5% of the IQ distribution is five times more important than having a high-income father. What about your own education then? How might that uh, matter? Now I'm going to show a similar graph as I did before, but instead of having parents' education go from left to right and increase, I'm going to have your own education do the same. And here's what it looks like. So these are the people with a base education, so nine years of schooling, and all the way to a master's degree and a PhD. And again, red bars are science, uh, and blue bars are non-science. So if you're a non-scientist like me, Getting a PhD is a bad idea if you want to get a patent. Okay, so I was doomed by the time I chose my field uh, and my degree. However, uh, getting a science degree is very helpful. And something you cannot have noticed because I've been so quick is that the scale on the y-axis is completely different from the previous graphs. So now we're talking of a 30% probability whereas we were talking single-digit percentages before. So, just in terms of raw data, own education completely dominates everything else. How does my graph change when I introduce, on top of everything that I already introduced, own education? Well, we go further down still. We're looking at this graph here, and now the difference between being born to a low-income father and a high-income father is only a rough doubling of the odds. I'm not saying that's not a big number, it's still a doubling, but it's way smaller than before. So, summarizing what we find, own education is an order of magnitude more important than anything else. To give you a flavor, having a science PhD is 50 times more important than having a high-income father. Having a science PhD is 15 times more important than being in the top 5% of the IQ distribution. I'm not saying that these things are not correlated with each other. Obviously, they are. Uh, and once we look at how the family background variables affect uh, your education, IQ clearly dominates everything else. So, going back to my motivation of uh, how to think about this, clearly we know, going back to my first question, invention benefit a lot of people, even within the inventing firm, including the blue-collar workers on the factory floor, 
and actually, if anything, surprising a little the people coming up with the invention. And secondly, in terms of this path towards invention, our data and our analysis clearly shows that what we want to do as a society is we want to make sure that those individuals who were unlucky in the parental lottery and got parents who don't have high education, who don't have high income, who don't have high socioeconomic status, but who have a lot of potential, that we allow them to proceed all the way through to an ALTA PhD and a lot of patents in the future. Thank you. <laughs>